dear members of the TUD community I, and dear guests, here in our Schönfeld Lecture Hall as well as online and the live stream, I am more than pleased, I have to tell you, that we are able to go forward with this first inaugural lecture on a university-wide level. And uh, even though the virus keeps us uh, in its hold, uh, we decided that given the right hygienic measures, we are able to even come together here in this lecture hall uh, to listen. I hope it's the same for you as it is for me. This is the highlight of my day. I'm very excited. And um, on, on, on two ends, first of all, because it's our first university-wide inaugural lecture, and second of all, we see each other here in this lecture hall, and it's the second time that I'm here in this lecture hall after uh, the time that I presented here when um, the next rector was elected. So for me, it's a very special place, and uh, I'm very happy that we can have the lecture here. Now, our very first university-wide inaugural lecture. What is it? Why do we need it? Let me start by saying that having to profess your knowledge to a lay audience as well as to your colleagues in science has always been an important rite of passage for a professor's career. And as you may or may not know, actually the origin of the term professor comes from the Latin word profiteor. What does profiteor mean? It means to declare oneself publicly, to make public statements in English, to profess. Unfortunately, in Germany, it doesn't work. So profiteor today. We will be watching this. The university-wide inaugural lecture, we found at the rectorate an important new event to create because it aims to introduce strategically important professorships to the university community. It also, of course, introduces key scholars and scientists to the university community, which we succeeded in recruiting to fill the respective chairs. Thirdly, we think that this event showcases recent developments in the respective departments that are hosting the chair, as well as in research centers, as we will learn a little later. And this also is important that in our large university we try to learn more about what other units are doing and get us talking about these things. So therefore, finally, the fourth reason for this format is that interdisciplinary linkages is the heart and soul of a modern university, a modern research university. And in order for interdisciplinarity to prevail and to expand, we need to create occasions. We need to create also settings in which I like to call them chance encounters can happen across disciplines. It's these chance encounters that in my mind are an important ingredient in the creative process that we call science. And so we try as the rectorate to, to develop our campus such that more and more of these settings as well as occasions uh, hopefully will occur and will come into existence. Now, let me give you some logistics. So this is the very first one. It's basically the kickoff of the new format, but it's going to continue all through our academic year, always on the third Thursday, every month during lecture times. 
you will be able to attend such a university-wide inaugural lecture here at this very lecture hall, always starting at 4.40 and always being at the same time streamed so that also people can watch from afar online. And of course, it doesn't come as a surprise to you that appointing outstanding individuals who have created a name for themselves, a profile for themselves in their respective fields, is one of the crucial tasks of any university, but in particular of universities of excellence, such as TU Dresden. And in addition to the academic track record uh, that the search committees look at, we at TU Dresden also are very much keen on increasing our international profile and increasing our diversity in the faculty and looking for the interdisciplinary orientation of our candidates. And when, it, when we succeed in bringing all of these ingredients together, I think we manage then to really prevail as a vibrant and dynamic hub of science in locally, regionally, and globally. Now, it goes without saying that one such extraordinary colleague is our guest of honor today, Professor Alexei Janikov, Chair of Ultrafast Microscopy and Photonics at CTQMAT and at the same time at the Integrated Center for Applied Physics and Photonics Photonic Materials, which is part of the, our physics department. So welcome, Alexei Chernikov, to the TUD community. And at the same time, I also would like to welcome the Chernikov family here in the hall and down in the lobby. It's your children. So we are also very pleased to have you here. And we welcome the Chernikov family uh, to our community. In a minute, Carsten Tim, Dean of the Physics Department, will introduce the strategic role of this very chair of ultrafast microscopy and photonics for the Physics Department and for our university. And then subsequently, Matthias Voiter, the speaker of the Excellence Cluster CTQMAT, will introduce Alexei Janikov. So I will not be taking away from this. But Finally then, the high point of this afternoon, in his inaugural lecture, Alexei Chernikov will address the fascinating platforms that atomically thin materials offer for fundamental research and future technologies as they absorb and emit light with high efficiency. And for those of you who might have gotten curious about Alexei as well as about his work and how he does it, I'm really recommending to check out the video clip uh, that he beautifully did in uh, just before this lecture. It's, it's online, you can check it out. I hope that we all enjoy this first inaugural university-wide lecture and look forward to our discussions afterwards. I'd like to thank, at that point, all the colleagues that made this event possible. And that starts with our protocol office, Christine Melkau, and the communication office, of course, our chief communication officer is here, Marianne Schmidt, the physics department, and of course, the excellence cluster, CTQMAT. Thank you very much to all the colleagues and uh, the ones who are responsible for the stream. Thank you, without you, we wouldn't be here. Now, Everyone is invited, don't run away after discussion and talk, to a little reception downstairs in the lobby. We are all freshly tested so we can be um, relaxed and enjoy a toast uh, to our inaugural lecturer later on. But now, Karsten, the floor is yours and I'm handing the mic over. Thank you.
thank you very much. <clears throat> so I would also like to welcome all of you here and, and online um, to this inaugural lecture. As the rector has emphasized, this is uh, a new format, and I'm particularly happy that uh, the Faculty of Physics is the first to uh, take advantage of it, to make use of it. Um, I also, of course, very much welcome uh, Alexei Chernikov. Officially, we have you know, talked quite a bit since he has been, has been here. So welcome to, to the Faculty of Physics. <clears throat> um, I would like to briefly describe um, how this new, newly established chair of uh, ultrafast microscopy and photonics fits into the strategy of the Faculty of Physics and um, the TU Dresden. And to that end, I have first to give you my, my, my take on what, what the focus of this chair actually is. So th this is now my three sentence summary. And of course, we will all hear more about this uh, shortly. Now this, this chair is, uh, concentrates on quantum materials with electrons that are spatially strongly confined in, in nanostructures and uh, also in ultra thin films and are coupled to photons, so there's the photonics, uh, which of, of course means, means to light. And uh, what is special about the spatial confinement is that uh, it leads, it enhances interactions between, between electrons. And that, that means that um, in such systems, there are um, quasi-particles, which are particle-like excitations, which are emergent in the sense that they have, they have properties that are different from the properties of the fundamental particles, which are, after all, only electrons and atomic nuclei. And also it's possible in such structures to um, precisely manipulate uh, these electrons and these quasi-particles by electromagnetic fields. And finally, <clears throat> the experiments are done on the natural time and length scales of, of these excitations. And the time scales are very short, which means the experiments have to be ultra fast. And the length scales are very short, also very short. So it's microscopic. Uh, microscopic. So that is why um, where this uh, denomination chair of ultra fast micros microscopy and photonics is coming from. <clears throat> the materials are typically, but not necessarily, uh, semiconductors, both organic and inorganic ones. And semiconductors are, of course, um, uh, highly important for applications in, in electronics. And that means that this new chair actually bridges two of the five um, research priority areas of TOD. Uh, it's, it's clearly rooted uh, in, in um, the area of material science and engineering, but it builds a bridge to the area information technology and microelectronics. <clears throat> now to turn to the Faculty of Physics, um, we have three particularly large and strong research pillars. The first one is um, strongly correlated and uh, topologically non-trivial quantum matter. The second is uh, organic semiconductors and devices made from, from these materials, and the third is nuclear and elementary particle physics. The, the cluster of excellence uh, on complexity and topology and quantum matter and CTQMAT is very clearly um, uh, focused on the first pillar. And Matthias Reuter will say more about this uh, in a moment. Um, this new chair um, opens new research directions both within CTQMAT and uh, the Faculty of Physics in particular by focusing on nanostructures and ultra-thin thin films, as I said. In, in this uh, respect, it links to another new chair, the chair of nanoscale quantum materials, which also is, belongs to CTQMAT, which is at the moment in, in the hiring process. And uh, it's also opening new doors by looking at, at these uh, systems at very short timescales. And in this respect, it links to uh, a recently hired colleague, um, Stefan Kaiser, who is the chair of ultra-fast solid-state physics and photonics. So that means we, we have not just created a single ch new chair here, but we have created, a, so to speak, cluster, a group of chairs who can work together and um, establish a new direction in the faculty and also in, in CTQMAT. What, what I like 
in particular, or also like in particular, about this, this chair is that it bridges two of the pillars I mentioned. Um, the, the chair obviously belongs to CTQ mud, which is a strongly correlated um, cluster, uh, belongs to the first pillar, but it is part of the Institute of Applied Physics, which is an internationally leading center of uh, organic semiconductors, which is the second pillar. Uh, so I, I'm convinced that the interaction that will follow from, from this uh, between these, these directions will be very fruitful for the faculty as a whole. And, and in fact, it already is fruitful, as we have seen in the preparation for a new um, collaborative research center, which is called Delocalization and Electronic Correlations in Organic Semiconductors, where Alexei Chernikov is part of and uh, for which we have just a few days, days ago submitted the proposal. So with this, I uh, would like to thank you for your attention and hand over to Matthias Reuter as cluster speaker. Thanks, Carsten, um, and also from my side, welcome everyone here and online. It's now my task to um, introduce the speaker of today, our new colleague, um, and to praise his achievements. But before I do so, I'll say a few words, take a few minutes of my time to tell you how this all started. And this is about CTQMAT. CTQMAT is a cluster of excellence funded since uh, the beginning of 2019, carried by the universities of Würzburg and Dresden. It's actually the only, the single and only excellence cluster uh, spanning federal boundaries in Germany. And uh, we like this quite a lot, traveling to Bavaria from time to time. Um, it was these 25 original um, PIs who filed the proposal. And CTQMAT, as the title says, is about basic research in physics, material science, and chemistry. And it revolves about around topology, which is a mathematical discipline, but uh, we have now in physics realized that it's extremely important in modern condensed matter physics. It's one of the key research areas. A Nobel Prize has been awarded for this in 2016. And it revolves about quantum materials. And so it defines the mission of what our cluster of excellence wants to do. We want to design materials, discover new phenomena, and deliver functionality with uh, an eye on um, topology-based quantum technologies, technologies uh, for tomorrow. So there will be applications, perhaps not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. And so our everyday work is about exploring topological physics in various settings in condensed matter physics, and we do this in, um, again, various areas, namely in topological electrons, topological band structures, in uh, quantum magnets, and in photonics, so in light and light matter interaction. And these constitute the three key research areas of the cluster. And they are, um, let's say, they are joined by the need for materials, and actually the design of new materials, and also by fundamental concepts, mathematical concepts for topological physics, and from these three research areas, we try to synthesize ideas for applications, and this defines our fourth research area in CTQMAT, which is about tailoring topological functionality. Now, this is basic research, as I said, so we don't know what the applications will be, and that's why we have fun with it. Um, but of course, there are a few things which we can envision where perhaps applications might arise, and I've listed a few here starting from lossless electronics, electronics consuming less energy than uh, what we have today, novel data storage device elements for quantum computing, and various other things. Now, this is what CTQMAT is about. And in the original proposal, one of the declared goals was to strengthen the research in optics and photonics, because this uh, was the research area out of the three A, B, and C defined here where comparatively little expertise was present, both in Dresden and in Würzburg. And that's why we planned, when writing the proposal, to establish a new professorship here to Dresden. And this is now why we are here. Uh, we opened this position and we hired Alexei. So this now brings me to the speaker of today. So um, let me say a few words about Alexei's scientific CV. 
Um, Alexei, as you can guess, was born in Russia, uh, moved to Germany at an early age, um, studied physics in Marburg, and I guess I have a few facts here, um, got his diploma there in 2008, um, continued there uh, for a PhD, got his PhD in early 2012, also in Marburg, then stayed there for a few months as a postdoc, then went to the United States, to Columbia University in New York, um, until 2016, and then returned to Germany and uh, managed to from DFG, and then became Eminator Group Leader in Regensburg, where he stayed until last year, when he actually moved to Dresden. And we are glad that you came here and that we managed to keep you here. Um, so Alexei's field that has been mentioned a number of times is uh, quantum matter, experimental quantum matter physics. That's, of course, the most important thing to say. Um, it's about optics and photonics. He has worked on, in particular on low-dimensional um, semiconductors. He started out working on semiconductor lasers, in fact and then um, moved to two-dimensional systems. He studied excitons. He has a lot of work on exciton transport, and he is an expert in observing them with ultra-fast techniques. And I will not say more about this because Alexei will cover many of these things in his talk. Let me just uh, say as last thing that he has been very successful with this. He was awarded the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Award of DFG in 2018, and he has managed to acquire an ERC consolidator grant quite recently. So, um, again, we are glad that you are here. And now, Alexei, the floor is yours. much. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you all for coming and uh, for joining in this event, both online and offline. And um, also, I would like to thank everybody, and there are quite a few people involved who were organizing this event and making it happen in such a manner. Um, and of course, I greatly appreciate there were a lot of very kind words being already said by our rector, Professor Staudinger, and by my colleagues, our dean of physics, Carsten Tim, and the speaker of the Situ Kumat cluster, Matthias Voiter. Professor Matthias Voiter, I'm sorry. Um, and of course, I'm very happy not to be here, not only to be here today and participate in this event, but also in a very general way, sense to join this excellent institution, to join to Dresden and also the broader Dresden area with a lot of research institutes and many colleagues working in a lot of really exciting and overlapping fields, a lot of interdisciplinary research. And what I would like to do in the next half an hour is to um, invite you for a little bit of an introduction both in the field of our studies and a little, some specifics of our own research. And the nature of this research, and this is something that I would like to emphasize right in the next slide, is collaborative. And we are, of course, very happy to be embedded in a large network of excellent groups all around the world from theory, experiment, Mathera grows, chemistry, physics, engineering, but of course I'm looking forward to expand it here in the Dresden area and of course at TU Dresden in particular. Um, even more important, and this is something that I would like to highlight, is it's a work of a team of scientists. And here I'm very much indebted to talented young researchers and in our group that are making it happen and um, the absolute majority of the data and of the results I will show you today is due to the excellent work of the people that you see here. And, of course, we are very happy to welcome new members to our group. So, both on the level, let's say, of bachelor and master students at the TU, but also the level of graduate um, candidates and postdocs, and um, um, I'm very much looking forward to, looking, to, to working together with, with um, new members of our team. And, of course, we uh, received uh, the funding that I'm very thankful for, uh, and in particular, as Matthias emphasized, the strategic um, kind of hiring by the Cetiku Mod Cluster 
is uh, one of the most important kind of pillars to be able to do actually this research that I would like to show you. So I would like to invite you for a little bit of a journey, so to speak, and to consider actually something very basic to begin with, and it's interaction of light and matter. And this is something uh, that occupied people for a long, long time. And the reason is actually very basic, because for the majority of us, visual information, using visual information to get, um, to learn about our surroundings, about our world, is of key importance. And therefore, for many centuries, and here is one, Striking example how people designed matter in a specific way to interact with light. And of course, nowadays it becomes ever more important. And the example that you see on the right is a bundle of optical fibers. Optical fibers are very thin strands of glass, specifically designed. It's actually quite, you know, a particular structure. And they are designed to, be able to transport light very efficiently, very, you know, with reduced losses over great distances. And the technology, even the one we're using now, we are streaming it online, is working based on that. So for example, our, the internet that we have, as fast as it is for many of us in our homes, is facilitated by light going through such a fibers. And of course, there are many other examples, including um, emitters, lasers, detectors, and a lot of it is being developed also here to address them based on a broad range of materials from organics to inorganics and various types of systems. But important as it is to use it eventually for applications that you see here is also the fundamental understanding that Matthias emphasized um, in, um, in his uh, talk in particular. And the fundamental understanding how this actually happens happened not too long ago. Just 100 years ago, people realized and accepted the picture of matter being um, composed of atoms. Yeah, this is something relatively recent. And the idea was that indeed, um, matter is composed of these particles where negatively charged, very small elemental particles called electrons, they go around a core. And uh, the important consequence of quantum mechanics was they just can't be anywhere. They have to occupy very specific levels. So for example, where an atom is excited by light, the electron has to jump over certain energy barriers to very specific spots, to very specific levels. And when the light is emitted, the same happens. And of course, if you, you, know, if you look around, our matter is not just atoms alone, gas. The majority of matter we interact with is condensed. So we're talking about systems where a lot of atoms are tightly packed, and in many cases, even in crystals with periodicity. And when atoms are packed in such a manner, then the structure of these electrons, the way how they are arranged, changes. And uh, instead of individual layers, it starts um, to um, build bands. They are very much continuous, a lot, a lot, a lot of electronic states. But in some cases, for some material classes, there is still kind of a gap, an energy gap for the electrons to jump over to the next level. And this class of material, an important representative are semiconductors. And um, as Matthias and Carsten emphasized, these are the basis for the modern technology. The things we use from our phones to the emitters, they are based to a large degree on this class of material. And on the fundamental process of lifting such an elemental particle and electron across this gap, leaving behind an empty state that in many cases behaves also like an electron, just with an opposite charge, those can move around, they transport charge, energy, information, but also can fall down and again emit light. And this is the basis, again, for our technology. Consequently, people were interested for a long time to control and change and understand the properties of such materials. But only in the, let's say, second half of the last century, technologically, um, one method was realized and explored that is actually very anti-intuitive. So for those of you, of course, who study quantum mechanics, it will be straightforward, but from our everyday experience, which is basically classical physics in many cases, what I'm gonna show you is actually something that is not, that we're not used to. And this is what we can call quantum size effect. And what it means is imagine any piece of materials. Imagine a piece of wood, a piece of metal, a piece of glass in front of you. And then think about making it smaller. Smaller and smaller. And your expectation will be that the properties of such system will not differ because we know it's still composed of the same atoms. It has you know, similar structures. What should change? But the observation is you go low enough. It's tiny enough. 
and then something goes on, and then the properties of materials can change very, very drastically on certain scales. And of course, about it, we learn that this is a consequence of quantum mechanics, and we learn about it in a problem that uh, we study in the very first course of quantum mechanics at a university, the problem of a quantum particle in a box. And for the means and purposes of this lecture, a quantum particle is just something, think about something very small and very light. Yeah, so you and I, we're not quantum particles, yes? So because of our size and our mass, we're not. But electrons are. But even electrons put in a box which is large enough, they will not care. They will behave as a classical particle. They will just sit at the bottom of this box. Nothing will happen. We make the box smaller, nothing happens, as long as it's large enough. But at some point, at some point the wave-like nature of electrons, the quantum mechanical nature of electrons starts to be relevant. It leads to the fact that now the energy levels again becomes discrete and quantized. That's also where the words quantum and quantum mechanics kind of comes from. And it shifts electron energies around. Just the size, we don't do anything else with the system, just the size. And this effect on the size on the electron properties and the properties of matter, interaction with light, interaction with external field, is the basis and the key paradigm for what we call nowadays nanotechnology that permeates a lot of applications in our today's life, but of course, with many more opportunities for the future. Yeah. And it comes in different sizes and shapes. So of course, we can make you know, the dimensions of material very small from all sides, or one can imagine something very elongated, or for example, something very flat, which will be called, let's say, quantum dots, wires, and wells for the expert in the audience that, that you know. Um, but a question one can have, how small can we actually make dimensions of a crystal? Right? I mean, this is a natural question that people asked um, over um, you know, quite some time. And one example to consider these questions is a class of materials that we know and people knew for everyday applications for hundreds of years. For example, graphite. Yeah, that's what you use when you write with a pencil. And graphite is composed as a very specific structure from a material that, for example, also can produce diamonds, yes, but here the carbon atoms are arranged in layers and they are weakly bound. And that means every time you write with a pencil, what you actually do when you write, you separate these layers. Yeah? And you are able to separate them. Try to write with a diamond. Yeah? If you have a diamond ring, try to write with this. This doesn't really work so well. Um, you will damage anything you try to write with. But graphene, you will just leave some layers on, this, on the surface. And this is the, con uh, com the consequence of this weak binding. And then people realize that, in fact, you cannot just produce some layers, but you even can produce an individual layer of such materials, which is, and that answers the question above, as thin as just one atom. This is the thinnest version that we can, that is chemically stable of a system in nature. And graphene is a very prominent example. It received the Nobel Prize in 2010 for its discovery, but not only because people make something very thin, but because they showed that by making it so thin, it had a plenty of properties that was very different from graphite. Yeah? And it sparkled a huge field of research. But for all sort of the, the interesting properties that graphene has, it is, it is not a semiconductor. It doesn't have this band structure with this gap, this energy barrier that the electrons need to jump to. And this we need, of course, if we think about all sorts of applications, as you can see here on the right, transistors, light emitters, lasers, detectors, and what's not. But luckily, material science is a very rich discipline, and van der Waals systems like graphite, there are hundreds, thousands of different materials, and among them is a big family that actually has semiconducting properties. It has all the properties we need to make this. And if you look at the structure, schematically, um, it's slightly more complex, so each layer is not just one atom, but a few. It consists of two different elements, but otherwise, it's very similar to graphene. It's layers, so we can of course, look at individual ones. And that's what people did. Um, and they did first a simple experiment, a very simple experiment. And it's one that jump-started the field with, uh, in, in many, many ways. And what they did, they just they took a crystal, OK? And they looked how light is emitted from this crystal. Yeah, nothing else. Uh, but the observation was that only one part of the crystal and the part that was just one layer thin, that is the only part they, that light light up. The only part that lights up, that's one, one uh, layer thin. Everything else is dark. And this is something kind of counterintuitive because normally we think matter that emits light, the more of it we have, 
you know, the brighter it should be. But here, even going to two layers already uh, dampens observation and no light comes out, only for monolay. And the realization back then, around 2010, was that yes, indeed, this quantum size effect is what matters. So something you know, uh, significant happens when we go from a thick system to just one layer because quantum mechanics kick in and then electron level starts to shift around and it happens in such a way that the relevant states are the ones that couple to light. But there was also a number of observations that, you know, um, that showed that looking at it from this perspective is not enough to understand a number of intriguing properties of these systems. And what we do usually from experimental side if we have a question like this, okay, some phenomena can be explained, but not completely, we look deeper into this, yeah? And, uh, but for this, we need materials. And uh, luckily, in this case, material production was a little bit democratized, so there is, it's relatively simple, so to speak, at least in principle, one still needs you know, good, good technique to produce single layers. And here you see um, PhD students in my group, uh, Jonas Ziegler and Edith Vitek, preparing such a monolayer. So we will take a big crystal over here. And then with a technique popularized by graphene in a slightly more involved manner nowadays, with a scotch tape, very carefully peel off individual layers, find them, stamp them deterministically, and then realize a picture like this, where over here you see a single layer of material. And for application, of course, I mean, this is good to do fundamental science. For application, there is a lot of development, of course, in scalable growth, for example, chemical vapor deposition that you see here. What I would like to focus on here is to emphasize and maybe kind of to invite you to appreciate the fact that what you're looking at right now, you see a contrast with your eyes. The image is not enhanced of one single layer. This layer is as thick as three to 10 to the minus 10 meter. It's a very small number, lots of zeros. And one example I can give you, think about a wing of a dragonfly. A wing of a dragonfly is pretty thin to begin with. Yeah? It's often just a couple of cells, tens of micrometers. But these layers are 100,000 times thinner. And nevertheless, you can still see them. Yeah? So they couple to light very strongly, and this is kind of highlights this uh, observation. So what we do with them, very often we put them in the fridges. We call them cryostates. We cool them down quite substantially, close to absolute zero. And the reason we're doing it is because if we want to study fundamental properties, often it helps to get rid of all the complexities that we have at room temperature, all the term and vibrations, activations. We want to freeze them out first to understand the system in its much more pristine and kind of cool state. And then we can go back to, environment, to environmental conditions that are important for applications. So this is the usual strategy that we very often use. What we do with this material to better understand how it couples to light and what's going on, we do spectroscopy. And by spectroscopy, of course, people among you who do spectroscopy, right? I mean, you're doing it for a long time, you're experts, you know it. But very generally, we can say, we look at light, reflection, absorption, emission, doesn't matter, but we resolve it by its color. Yeah? It can be called wavelengths, photon energy, never mind. And that we do here. And data that we gain from this can look like this. You know, it's a curve. We look at reflectance here, orange, yellow, green, goes towards blue. And the shape of this curve, it doesn't really matter too much. But what one can recognize here, that it has certain features that repeat themselves in a very specific sequence. And this sequence is known for a long time, more than 100 years, actually from atoms. Not from crystal, not from condensed matter, but from single atoms. And already here we see that, you know, as I showed you in the beginning, then when we pack a crystal, then the electronic structure changes. We don't have this individual layers. We have bands, you know, so the response is kind of continuous. But here again, we go back to single atoms. And that means that we have interaction in the system that produces a response that looks like an atom, but obviously it is not. And it's a quasi-particle. And the quasi-particle that we study here comes about in the following way. Again, we take the semiconductor and we create with light, we lift an electron, give it some energy, lift it up, remains, is an empty state, it's effectively positively charged. But between those, they're charged, there is of course interaction, right? And this we learn in school, there is electrostatic interaction. They attract each other. But in matter usually, this interaction is strongly suppressed because matter kind of reduces and weakens electric fields by a lot. It screens them out, as we say. But here we have no matter. 
outside the material. So by the nature of it being thin, the interaction, as was emphasized by our previous speakers, is enhanced. And then what happens that instead of you know, looking at individual electronic particles, we are dealing with a quasi-particle. We are dealing with the state so, you know, that propagates together, it holds together, and uh, can be conceptualized as a new, yeah, as, a, as I say, as a new quasi-particle. And in the community, it's called an exciton. And people know about excitons for some time, and um, basically in many materials, a good example are organic crystals that are studied here quite a bit. These are the particles that are responsible for light emission and absorption. So every time you see an organic LED, when, I don't know, you buy a um, high contrast uh, TV, these are excitonic emitters in their nature. They are many particle states several, uh, that it's not individual electrons. And here the particularly interesting uh, property of this one is that its binding energy, the way how it's composed, is so strong that it's 10 times fluctuation as at room temperature. So it means this particle is extremely stable and all phenomena associated with it are relevant not only when we cool down, 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 but when we study it at ambient conditions and even above. And in this class of atomically thin materials, these excitons, these quasi-particles, these light emitters, govern essentially the majority of the properties relevant both for fundamental science and applications. Examples are very efficient light emission absorption. The excitons are the primary carriers of energy and information. So carriers of energy, think about a solar cell. Carriers of information, think about a transistor type of device. One can realize so-called single photon emitters. And this is something very specific. It means that there is an object and it can emit only a photon at a time. So the smallest particle of light at a time. And these are considered the basis for quantum computing. For quantum computing, we need single photon sources. And there is a plenty of correlated and topological phenomena in complex structure. And this is an extremely recent and very hot field nowadays to look at that. And of course, very relevant in the context of Citikumat cluster. What we're looking in our group is tunability. We want to learn how we can change things. And we look at dynamics. So we look how things behave kind of as a function of time, uh, what's going on, because in system with interactions, this is very important. And examples are, for example, ultra-fast optical modulation, so how rapidly we can change properties, optical response of matter. We look at strategies to tune the properties of materials through environment, and this is something that is um, a very powerful strategy in this type of materials. We look at also imperfections, which is important in material science and in nanotechnology, and that are interaction induced. And of course, we strive to gain electrical control over a system that is intrinsically relevant for optics and kind of bridge the electronics and optics. And for all these reasons that are you know, roughly summarized here on the right, this light emitting particles, excitons, attracted one particular question in the community. And the question is, how do they actually move? And to appreciate it, in principle, again, our technology right now, based on the fact that we can manipulate movement of electrons with insanely high precision. But electrons, they are more easier to manipulate because as you see, it's a charged particle. You apply an electric field and then you can move it around. A quasi-particle, that is of course very interesting because it emits light, it, you know, it governs all sorts of properties in nanosystems, but because it's something from a negative and positive charge, it's neutral. So we can apply a field and you know, not much happens. And, um, but we also need to know whether it goes fast, it goes slow, there are applications we want it to be mobile. Yeah? So if you think about transporting energy information, you want to do it fast. If you think about emitting light, for example, you just want to trap it somewhere and act as a very efficient emitter. So it's necessary and important to study it and a lot of groups have started it you know, for a few years ago and we joined in this quest. Uh, but the question is how we measure movement of a particle that we have, you know, a hard time seeing in a material that is just one atom thin. And the basic paradigm to do this is actually very simple. We do the same thing you would do if you were interested of how ink molecules propagate in water. Obviously, you can track down every single molecule of ink, but you don't need to and maybe you don't want to because you're interested in average behavior. And the way, the way you do it is the following. You inject particles locally. So for example, this is an example experiment I did last week in uh, my daughter's, um, so taking my daughter's colors, put it in the pipette, injecting the colors locally in, in water, 
Then we monitor the diffusion and we look basically as function of time how the ink slowly, you know, the ink spot slowly grows. And from this, we can learn how fast ink propagates through water. We can change all sorts of conditions. We can add some oil, make it more dispersive. We can heat it up, we can cool it down. We can apply external field, you know, you can use gravity to manipulate it and learn about how these molecules propagate. And now we need to do the same, but again, for quasi-particles that are very short-lived in materials that is just an atom or a few atoms thin. And to do this, of course, we need slightly more advanced technology that is shown on the left. And in our labs, what we do uh, is we use very short laser pulses, and I will comment a little bit on this time scale. Uh, we focus them very tightly. So what you see here is a spot that is 100 times smaller than the width of the human hair, half a micrometer. And with the same resolution, we also look at the light that is emitted from the systems. And we do it as function of time. And as function of time, what you see on this graph is that the area, be it an ink spot, be it a spot of this exit on the quasi-particles, it grows over time. And if the growth is linear, we know it's diffusive transport for the expert in the audience. More importantly, in many cases, we need a resolution that is as fast as 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Of course, nowadays, for some people, if you're working with ultra-fast optics, there are even faster timescales. But 10 to the minus 12 is already pretty fast. Uh, but of course, you know, when you read it, you say, okay, it's 12 zeros is just a very small number. But to appreciate it, imagine the following light. Light is very fast, right? That we know. Light is very fast. It's the fastest thing we have for, you know, very fundamental reasons. But in one second, light goes eight times around the world. Eight times, one second. In the same one second, light goes one trip to the moon. In 10 to the minus 12 seconds, which is a picosecond, light barely goes a fraction of a millimeter. You would barely be able to see it. That's how fast it is. But that's a resolution, the resolution we need. And luckily, nowadays, with the technology we have, there are detectors that are as fast, and there are laser pulses that are as short. And this is how we do these experiments. Now, the lab looks like this. This is a part of our setup. You see here Edith Wiedek and Koloman Wagner operating such a setup. Um, in principle, what one can see, there is laser light that is guided through various optical elements. There is a microscope in the background. There is a detector in the background. And using these techniques, Using these experiments, now we can learn how light emitting particles, how they propagate, how they move. We can learn about their transport behavior. And in the last kind of a couple of slides, I would like to show you a few examples. And the one, the first one is actually very straightforward, but it's also very important for practical reasons. Imperfections, disorder. Because if I show you something like this, there is this material, this is, there is this crystal, so we look from the side here, floating in space. You can say, okay, this is a bit of PowerPoint physics. That's not reality because, you know, you barely have a crystal floating in space. The reality is much messier. We have surroundings. The surroundings can be homogeneous, you know, some imperfection of the substrates, all sorts of things that will affect local properties and make them scatter. They make them inhomogeneous. They make disorder. It's often detrimental. But if you understand how it happens, why we have disorder, we can also get rid of it. And in this case, what we do, we encapsulate this material in also extremely thin crystals. So we create a sandwich, protect it. And then, if we look at the properties of such a system, what we see that, well, in a pristine sample, we have some propagation. So, you know, excitons move somehow, fine. But if we encapsulate it, we get rid of disorder, then the transport becomes extremely fast. And of course, we can do statistics, and we should do statistics. And there we see it's about a factor of 25 enhancement in mobility. So the, the result here is not only that the excitons can propagate very rapidly, and this is all room temperature, but for the experts in the audience, if we compare it with effective mobility of electrons, because those are usually the numbers people have in their mind when they think about mobility, it is something like 400, yes? And for an excitonic system at room temperature, it is arguably one of the highest mobilities, and maybe, and this is always a very dangerous statement to make, maybe even the highest. This is always hard to tell. But it shows that this particle, is, despite being strongly bound and relatively small, can also be very mobile. And that was one of the first results that was very encouraging for us. In addition, there are all sorts of very interesting collective phenomena. I will not go too much detail, just show you one. When you inject a lot of these particles, very interesting effect happens. Instead of, you know, kind of just diffusing and, and uh, very, you know, uh, trivially, they form rings. 
Yeah, the foam rings, it's indication of interactions, it's indication of memory effects, if you, you know, if one thinks about it um, in a little bit more detail. But also, it's a phenomenon that happens at room temperature, and this is very unusual. So people saw such effect before in gallium arsenide, 10 years ago, but it's all cold temperatures. Here, we see such collective phenomena, such ring formation at ambient conditions. Um, but for all the observations of how these particles diffuse and move when we just look at it, ideally, ideally, we want to guide their motion. We want to be able to determine how they move. Because this is, again, what we want to do with electrons and what we are doing very successfully with electrons. Still, um, oh, I don't have my phone is there. <laughs> but if I would hold the phone or I show a computer, it's based on controlling electron motion and guiding it in some way. But as I explained, with excitons, it's not so easy because they're neutral. Yeah? So if we make an electric field, it will push it in one direction, in the other, nothing will move. But what we use here is a property that is also very specific when you make matter thin. It's that now you can do mechanical, a lot of mechanical flexibility and use mechanical strain, mechanical deformation to create potentials, to create maybe guides for motion. And of course the principle, so I just, you know, to quickly demonstrate it, right? You take matter that is thick and, you know, regardless of its properties, it will be relatively stiff. Yes? Just by the nature of thickness. But those systems are very easy to manipulate because if we just take one layer, Right now, okay, now you can bend it, you can twist it, and what's not. So, and this is something, it applies for graphene, it applies for this type of systems. The mechanical deformation, strain, as we call it, is a very powerful tool to do things, to change, to create potentials, to create kind of energy landscapes. And in a proof of concept, we do something simple. We take a nanomechanical nano object. In this case, it's a nanowire. It's just something that is very, you know, small in diameter and very long and we stretch, we stretch our semiconductor material on top of it. And that creates a channel along this wire. And then we switch the lights on, we look at the quasi-particles, how they move, how they emit, and we show that yes, indeed, along the wire, now they can you know, go very fast, but across the transport is completely suppressed, so you see the area of emission doesn't increase at all. And that means that in this case, instead of particles just randomly going in any direction they want in this crystal, one manages to kind of say, okay, now there is just one avenue they can travel to. And importantly, again, I show here it's very cold temperatures, minus 268 Celsius, 5 Kelvin, but we go to room temperature conditions. The same holds true. Highlighting, again, the importance of strong interactions in the system, we can do things at room temperature. And uh, very last, result I want to briefly discuss with you is rooted in a very fundamental question and that, you know, we usually don't ask in our everyday life because in our everyday life we are classical particles, we understand how classical particles move, but for quasi-particles it can be very different, so the nature of its motion. But nevertheless, even if they are quantum particles, in many cases people think about them in, this, in such systems as classical ones, so the movement would be Basically, this type of random motions, you know, from billiard balls, particle flies in some direction, it scatters randomly, changes direction, scatters, changes direction. Something like this, whether they are excitons or billiard balls, doesn't matter. But the hard thing is to test it, we need to control very precisely a number of conditions. I will not go into much details. Produce samples. Here you see Marcia Kuku uh, doing it on a, on a single layer WSE2, so such a crystal cool them down, control several things, get rid of disorder, and ultimately study mobility as a function of temperature. This is true for electrons, the same we do for excitons. And there is a semi-classical expectation for the system that looks like this, but the measurement looks differently. Yeah, and looks differently also in a very specific way. It shows us, again, more for the experts among you, you will see this shows you that the particles are not localized. That would, the curve would be the opposite but it's definitely not classics. And one explanation came from a theoretical work that was very recent that predicted exactly this temperature dependence, considering a phenomenon that, again, we never would encounter in real life that is called quantum interference. And what it showed in this particular publication that, yes, indeed, this light-emitting absorbing particle can travel classically for some time. This is all fine and good, but at some point, at some point, it enters a state 
being in a loop and going through this loop in one direction and in the opposite direction simultaneously and then interfering with itself. And, you know, for, for, for anyone who is not studying quantum, actually even for people who are studying quantum mechanics, this is not a very usual behavior. This is something you would never enter. You know, you would never see it in, 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 in uh, kind of our macroscopic world. But quantum particles can do just that, propagate in two directions simultaneously, and that produces, in this particular case, certain effect in the propagation that explains the temperature dependence. And with that, I would like to come very briefly to an outlook because there are a lot of things we want to explore. I gave you a few examples, some of them specific, but also maybe to give a little bit of an overview of what type of phenomena we study, of what type of system we're looking for. Um, we are very much engaged with ongoing experiments to look at variety of artificial crystals. Again, this is a very hot topic in our field. This is the way to do you know, superconductivity from relatively simple structures to realize localized, like areas of quantum emitters. Um, here you see type of a mosaic type pattern, study topological phenomena, collective phenomena, and this is something that we're looking for and to collaborate with people working on similar subjects here in Dresden. We want to place matter in external fields that are very strong. This helps a lot with both understanding fundamental phenomena such as the quantum transport, but also potentially enabling you know, directions towards applications. Uh, we have uh, funding from ERC to look at the strategy to use the environment to manipulate the properties of these materials and to look whether we can do it very fast or maybe on very small scales. And of course, we're going more and more towards novel quantum materials that are uh, used and studied also here in Dresden quite a bit in various groups for their application and let's say solar cell photovoltaics, information transport. Examples of hybrid perovskite to the organics, and you know there is a really a very uh, big material base that we want to explore, understand fundamental phenomena, but also with a keen eye for technologies, as Matthias Neidl said, of the day after tomorrow and maybe after after tomorrow. But this is very important because we need to do it now, to have it in 20 years, to have it in 30 years, and to explore it. And with that, I would like to conclude. I thank you all very much again for coming, both on and offline. It's a great pleasure. And of course, I'm here to answer any questions you may have and hopefully to share a drink and a snack with you afterwards. Thank you. So thank you very much, Alexei, for this uh, talk. And perhaps uh, I might say this as someone who has often taught quantum mechanics. And I very much liked your introduction <coughs> on to quantum mechanics for non-experts. <laughs> very good. Um, so are there questions? So there's a microphone going around. Yeah, thanks for the very nice talk, Alexei. Um, what is the defacing time T2 of the excitons under these conditions, and to which mm -hmm. degree does it influence the mm -hmm. transform? Uh, so, um, let me just go back here because I think this, I mean, this is the relevant, this is the relevant slide for this. So um, around five Kelvin, uh, we're talking about a couple of picoseconds in a clean sample. And we have uh, over the first, let's say 50 Kelvin, it's main interaction with linear acoustic phonons, so long wavelength phonons, and it will grow with something like um, 50 micro EV per Kelvin with temperature linearly. So you will get to the phasing, uh, Okay, I'm talking in energies, right, but something like 10 MeV at 50 Kelvin, so we're talking about 100 femtoseconds, so going from a couple of picoseconds to femtoseconds. Uh, and in room temperature, of course, you go down to 20, 30 femtoseconds uh, due so to the, phonons. The ensemble doesn't have uh, a coherence anymore, but uh, why do you yeah. have this loop state Oh, yeah, so this is, is lost? this is an excellent question. We've been discussing it with our colleague quite a bit. So what happens here is, of course, so this is something I want to emphasize, each time it scatters, it loses phase completely, right? I mean, this is clear, so there will not be interference if this passes would be, you know, distinct. But if it goes around the same loop, exactly the same loop, think about a static potential, then the relative phase, even if it's random, of the both loop will be the same. But this dephasing times is not governed, is not picoseconds, it's actually much longer, the relative phase loss. This is connected to the inelasticity of the scattering. And the way the curve looks like is because the inelasticity and the collision time scales differently with temperature in a specific fashion. This is, of course, something I would not bring here. But it's a different phasing time. That's maybe, yeah. 
We started already with a very tough one, actually. <laughs> Hi, so uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this very interesting and also very motivating task, uh, talk. Um, I would like to continue with a rather easy question, probably. Thank you. You showed, <laughs> <laughs> you, you showed that the uh, excitons which you created at one uh, spot like distributed in a ring shape. Um, on one slide. So my question is, is it actually a ring shape uh, which spreads uh, continuously in a ring form or is it actually a wave, like uh, in the same manner that you could probably mm. d uh, drop a bit of water yes. and then you get this water wave mm -hmm. behavior? Excellent question. The, uh, when I was discussing it with, with a PhD student with whom we did the experiment together, it was the first assumption that you would think about, right? I mean, for any of you, you drop a stone of water and you would think, come on, you know, what, what is strange about just a wave that is propagating? But that actually then connects back to the question that, that Carl asked, that you would expect this coherent propagation, like in water, of a wave, only when your dephasing would be very, very long. But that's not what's going on here. So if you would have like a ballistic wave. This can happen, people see it in systems, you know, high quality gallium Mars and cool it down, they can see it. It's called also phonon wind effect sometimes. So you create a lot of phonons and they push your excitons, it goes like a wave. Here it is actually more of a diffusion motion. It's, it's connected to something like a Zabik effect. So you have very hot excitons in the middle that, you know, they drive this ring formation. You have phonons that diffuse, but they drag the excitons with them. Uh, so in this case, it's not a ballistic wave. It can be a ballistic wave, but here it is not. Yeah, I hope it answers. Uh, I think, yeah. Yes. So um, you said this is connected physics here. Yes, correct. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, well, kind of. So there are there are <laughs> So the first thing we realized, and this is very, you know, in a very formalistic way, if you look at diffusion equation and you insert any type of non-linearity non in the diffusion, you do non-linear diffusion, you will never get a ring shape. You will always saturate here because gradient density drives it and regardless how non-linear it will not help. So what you need is a memory effect in the system. You need something that happens in the middle that makes those particles different. There are several things that can happen. You can have overheated phonons that are in the middle that created by excitons. So it's exciton phonon interaction. The collective part here is that the exciton population heats up by itself by Auger type scattering. So what happens is at sufficient densities, excitons collide, one exciton recombine, the other one gain excess energy. It heats up the exciton system, it heats up the phonon system, not the lattice temperature by itself, but the non-equilibrium phonons, and that drives the ring formation. That's where the collective comes from. It's exciton exciton interaction that is at the core, what we think at least here. Yeah. Otherwise, you can imagine materials. So if you take, for example, linear dispersion, you take ballistic propagation in something like graphene, you would expect it just from the dispersion alone. Yeah, but that's not the case here. Which is something you would be able to distinguish because the speed would be different. That's correct. No, and because we would need to think that we have a ballistic wave that is just not reconcilable with this scenario. But people propose ideas like this. They calculate band structures that look like this and say in such a band structure, if your exciton moves, then it should do a ring, not because of many body interaction, but because of the band structure itself. Yeah, but here we are rather convinced that it's not the case for you know, a variety of reasons. I'm probably embarrassing myself, completely naive. I was excited by your one experiment where you're trying to guide the yes, excitons. Yes, yes. If you, exactly. Yeah. And this may be possibly completely naive and maybe you controlled it. Um, when I was looking at this, so the sheet is bent over the wire. Correct. And um, the length extension is less bent than the sideways expansion. Do you have a way to control for, for the shaping mm -hmm. so it could have other influences why they don't go sideways? Yeah. So actually on the meta level, one of our referees asked us this question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so honestly, I mean, the, the, the thing here, the challenge here is to actually know how it's precisely bent. 
And this is also something that here in Dresden, so one of our, also was connected to ERC project, one of our acquisition is a, is a microscope, and there are actually a few ones in, our, in, in the labs in our institute, in various groups, that can actually look very locally at, the, at how it's actually bent. We couldn't here, here we couldn't. What we could do is to, so we, we looked at the optical properties where you can assume a certain, where you kind of see a certain type of bending because you can track energies and you can kind of indirectly uh, determine, let's say, how much it is bent. But if we're looking at where something very precise, as you said, you know, what happens at the side, how it is bent, where maybe there's a lot of strain, maybe less, this is something that we, we couldn't know here. And uh, we just knew that we create some kind of a guide, but how it looks precisely at the site was not known at the stage, and this is actually part of activities. So, and this is roughly also what we told the referee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a good question, yes, of course. Just, let me just follow up with a question of my own here. Since you, you are showing this, it looks like in the, word, in the, in the um, transverse direction it gets, it shrinks actually. Yes, now, now Carsten becomes like a trope because we had two referees, right? And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, this is actually something. So, no, so, so, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I didn't emphasize it, but yes, this curve is going down. It looks like negative diffusion, which, you know, would violate the third law of thermodynamics. So, uh, but people discuss funneling, they call it. And mm -hmm. it's basically something that, right, I mean, you create a groove and maybe the particles will, you know, go into this groove. Mm. Here, again, we, we observed all sorts, so sometimes it was like this, sometimes it was zero, so it is very hard to say definitely if it happens. People looked at it. It is connected to the question how the sides actually look like, mm -hmm. and we arguably need smaller spots, which is challenging with optics, so we need to do something near field that you know, we're not experts of, but other people are. Uh, but that can entirely happen. But it's a very controversial topic in this community. So I didn't even dare to bring it here. But, you know, whether it, 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 can, it can happen or not. Yes, but yes, it could. You could imagine the scenario that you actually, you know, they go into the middle. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Alexei. Thank you very much. Follow-up question here. If you put your graphene armchair or zigzag, does it matter um, along the long axis? I don't know. Yeah, so, so we don't have, here already... we don't have, yes, here we don't have, so this is artist impression, by the way, right? So we don't know the crystallographic orientation. It can be determined by, let's say, two-photon spectroscopy with some degree of precision. And of course, you can think in certain scenarios actually may matter if you think about some array type of physics. And this is certainly something to explore. But here, we were not able to do it at that stage. Yeah, good question. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, the only thing actually, so maybe I can, a few things. We did, of course, quite a few statistics, you know, different cases. So you would say, okay, randomly we still see the guiding effect. Probably doesn't matter how the angle is, but with the angle is always a tricky thing. And before I see a measurement where we control it properly, I would be careful to make a statement. Yeah, but sure, orientation can matter. Thank you. Other... Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for this very brilliant and clear talk. I have a um, question to the to the um, basic feature of an exciton. How long does it live? What is the lifetime, and can you influence its lifetime? Because I can imagine there is no unique lifetime, and it depends on the on the surroundings. Absolutely correct. Yes. So the states that are bright. You know, I was, I was talking about excitons in close connection to the fact, oh, they are so bright, that explains why the material is so bright. For the same reason they are bright, they live also very short. So their lifetimes can be picoseconds, they can be smaller. So in cases where we need long-lived particles, we go, we do a trick, actually, and we go to so-called dark states. We call to state that not actually coupled to light that much, just a little bit, just enough for us to observe it, but uh, which cannot recombine very quickly, and then they live quite long. And long for us, nanoseconds is already long. People have showed, I think, tens of nanoseconds. This could be the scales. Of course, you start to localize them. You can go to microseconds, but then they don't move. So, you know. Um, but usually, so for, this, uh, for the quantum transport part, 
We took dark excitons because we wanted to avoid all sorts of overheating. We wanted equilibrium conditions. So we waited for 100 picoseconds, doing nothing, and then started measuring for another nanosecond, maybe. Yeah. And yes, environment influences it. It influences their scattering and influences their binding energies. So all of it we need to control, and that's what we try to do. Yes. Hi. Um, so when we have these excitons on graphene, for instance, is it possible to assign a certain like molecular orbital level where they are traveling on, or um, how does one has to imagine how they are bonded to the material? Mm. So, so you mean just basically how we should think about the exciton from the molecular orbital point of view? Is that exactly? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, basically, I mean. I, I need to try not to go on a lengthy, you know, <laughs> explanation how to imagine excitons in K-space. But you can think about excitons are composed from certain electronic states, right? And uh, from some region of the band structure. And in this particular case, the bright ones that we know of, they're composed from d orbitals of the metal atom. That, so if we go back to, uh, this of course we don't just, you know, think of, we have people calculating it and, uh, but in this particular case, they come from orbitals, d orbitals, dz, dxy, uh, that are localized right in the middle, which makes them even less uh, you know, sensitive to what's in the next layer electronically. There are other excitons. They live more on the sides. They have contribution from p orbitals of the calcogens. They couple strongly together. They lead to quantum size effects and what's not. And there are all sorts of manifolds and combination of it. So it's, there are a lot of different ones. That may be a very simple Thanks. answer, but that's more specific, yeah. Uh, Alina, Jana, Jana is behind. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so you mentioned applications, right? You have one hour in applications the day after tomorrow. And here are a few. So what do you think would be the next application where really these materials will make an impact? That's a challenging one for a number of reasons. So I would feel, so photonics broadly, so thinking about, think about low threshold lasers, polariton lasers, something like this. This is a direction a lot of people are looking for because you directly take advantage of the light matter coupling. Solar cells certainly not for the monolayer. I mean, this is obvious, especially for you. You're an expert in solar cells. For solar cells, people need stacks. Uh, it goes with Moray-type systems. So the Moray is interesting because by the nature right, of doing the layers like this, you basically deterministically create an area of quantum emitters. And this is something that is very challenging right, to do in quantum technology to make thousands of quantum dots that look all the same and behave all the same. And this is the direction over here. But then we enter an area of application, which is quantum computers, which can have time scales for five years to 50. And there are a lot of approaches, including topology, that is being pursued. But from people that I discuss, you know, these things with and in this field, the feeling is that that is the direction that most of it is going. Of course, there are people interested in photocatalysis. There are people interested in uh, sensing. Because of this environmental sensitivity, you can think about, you know, things that are sensitive to the presence of specific molecules because of screening strain, what's not. Yeah, this is the other's hand. But otherwise, a lot of push from the quantum technological kind of perspectives. Um, transistors, well, that's always a dangerous topic because I think, you know, for transistors, if you think about what will be the next iPhone, the basis for it, the reasonable answer is silicon, 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 for other reasons. Here, if you can do it very fast, if you can do it very small scales, maybe in some day, but there are right a lot of other challenges to solve. Yeah, uh, but otherwise, anything photonic that is small. Yeah, if I leave it at that. I don't see any right now. There will be opportunity to ask in private after that. And so let's uh, thank Alexei again for the talk. Thank you very much. Don't go away. Professor Staudinger, I can also step up. There is a final thing to do here. Oh, yeah, sorry, wait, wait, wait. Then we shouldn't do it in front of Totoro. <laughs> Let me go.
go somewhere. Somewhere here. Yeah, yeah, but uh, let's, let's go here. That's nice. Yeah, let's stay here. Matthias, Alexei, great thanks pleasure. a lot for the great <laughs> talk. It was a pleasure. And again, that's the final word of welcomes you will probably hear today. So welcome to Dresden again. We wish you all success. And uh, success, uh, these wishes come from all parts of CTQ. I was talking to Ralf Klaesen this morning, my Würzburg colleague. Um, he wanted to be here originally, but couldn't come yeah, due sure. to, for obvious reasons. Yes. So he sends his regards. And with this, welcome and all the best wishes for the future. Matthias, thank you very much. This is a very nice gesture. Thank you. So now we are supposed to take four yes. spots yes. for the photograph. I think so, yeah. Yeah. For us. Frau Stellinger, over here. Just on the left.